So I bought a new soldering iron the other day. Now I don't do a ton of soldering, truth be told. Like there's a lot of Tim the Toolman homeowner types who probably do more than me per annum. It's not for lack of interest. It's just I'm not all that good at it. If you give me one of those DIN plugs with the solder cups on the back, I will send that thing straight to hell. Melt all the pins right out of the body. Just butcher it. But I've been soldering pretty much my whole life. I Probably since I was like five or six. I've known how to do it right, even though I'm no good at doing it right. And I hate using bad tools, even if I'm going to do a bad job with them anyway. So if I'm going to be soldering, I want to use a good soldering iron. Now, I have a good soldering iron. I've got a Weller uh, WES-51, I think. I think they're discontinued now. It's a low-end professional production soldering station. Uh, some might disagree with that, but I've personally seen low-end professional electronics being produced with it. It's a pretty good station, if you ask me. It's got more than the bare minimum features. They got newer ones now, got digital readouts on them and everything, and those ones are probably more accurate, easier to set exactly where you want them, but this one works perfectly fine. I've never had any complaints about it. When I've wrecked a project, it's never been the tool at fault. Trouble is, I bought that thing not long after the age of majority, and I still haven't done all that much with it. And sometimes I wonder if that's not because it's too much effort to get it out and set it up. Don't get me wrong, it's not complicated. It's got about four pieces. You got the base station with the power supply in it, you got the iron itself, you got the stand, and the sponge. It's not much work, the trouble is I'm super lazy. Also, I need an available outlet to use it. Have you met me? Do I look like someone who doesn't have every outlet in his house plugged up to something already? Plus, I gotta make room on the bench, and artificially clean for the purpose of a video is the cleanest any bench has ever been near me in my life. So I've been thinking about a portable soldering iron for a long time. Trouble is, the pickings are pretty slim, and they always have been. There's those butane irons, of course. Those things go back like half a century, but they sort of look like what you use if you gotta. You basically light a little flame in them that heats up, a, I think, a catalyst that produces a ton of heat. It gets the tip hot, and I'm sure you can solder with that, but I'm guessing there's no temperature control, to say the least, and it's probably something you use if you're really caught out. You know, you're in a car that's stranded in the rainstorm on the side of a road, or you're in a locomotive that's stranded on the tundra, and, and you're going to literally die unless you can solder something. For those sort of things, I'm sure they're fantastic, but I've never liked the idea of using fire for things inside my domicile, or even my sub. Now, for most of my life, a battery-powered soldering iron was never really an option. Well, I mean, there were these. Do they still sell these things? I haven't checked. The Cold Heat was an as-seen-on-TV uh, infomercial-type product that tries to use resistive heating instead of a heating element. Just uses a bunch of AA batteries, runs tons of current uh, through the joint that you're trying to solder, and tries to heat it up enough to melt solder. Terrible idea. Uh, as the name implies, it creates nothing but cold solder joints. These things were a total scam. I don't know if they still sell them, but either way, that was never a solution. Thing is, the cold heat was the product of an earlier era when the double A was king, and these sort of batteries, alkalines, never had the kind of oomph you need to run a resistive heating element. But hey, we're free from the tyranny of double A's, right? We've moved forward into the era of lithium ion. If it's got enough oomph to set your phone on fire, set your vape on fire, set your car on fire, and burn your house down, it's got enough oomph to melt some solder. So ever since massive lithium ion packs started getting put in everything, I've been waiting for a good battery powered soldering iron to come along and it just keeps not happening. Every year I go and look into this again and all the stuff available looks like crap. Like Weller, Heiko, and a couple other recognizable brands, they have offerings, but they look super, super basic. Like, I don't think they have temperature control. The tips look really weird. Um, I imagine they don't have very good runtime. Probably just a single internal 18650 doesn't run for all that long. Then you got to recharge it in place. Uh, no stand, no nothing, right? They just look austere. They kind of look like if one of those butane irons was updated to run on batteries, but was otherwise still just a survival tool. But sometime in the last few years, a couple of the tool manufacturers finally started making irons that take their tool batteries, which is far more interesting to me than just uh, an 18650 or like a LiPo flat pack uh, that I have to recharge in place. If it's something that I actually use with other stuff, I'm far more likely to actually keep it charged, and it's more likely to actually have enough capacity to do something useful. You can tell, of course, that Ryobi makes one. I'll be talking about this, but they also make a second one that's about half the price, and then Milwaukee makes one. Now, 
I like Milwaukee. They're actually the same company. Uh, TTI, Tektronic Industries, owns Ryobi and Milwaukee. And uh, a lot of people are pretty convinced that they basically come out of the same factory, as it were, have a lot of the same engineers working on them. But the Milwaukee stuff tends to be a bit nicer. Trouble is, one, it takes their 12-volt battery system, which I don't have anything with right now, and I don't really want to get into it. None of that stuff looks too appealing to me. And also, I went and took a look at the tool, both at Home Depot and online, and it also looks pretty austere. It looks a little less rickety than the Weller and the Heiko ones, but all the same, there's nowhere to put it when the tip is hot, right? What are you going to do? Throw it in your, in your tool bag, stick it in your pocket, right? Doesn't look like it has any temperature control, and I don't know what the whole, uh, you know, wobbly, floppy articulation thing that they can do is about. Plus, some people on my Discord looked up some reviews and found people saying that they break if you sneeze on them. One guy said he bought nine of them and they all broke the same way in short order and he said the problem is that the ceramic heating element just snaps off and really if you take a look at how that works it's nuts i've never seen this in a soldering iron before it's just this big long pencil lead hanging out of the thing i'm, I'm shocked it can make it through shipping so at least that takes a more serious battery but it still looks pretty rough that leaves the ryobi's now the Ryobi options both take their one plus 18 volt battery system, which I think at this point when you're born, the US government just issues you one of these along with like your social security card. I think everyone has at least one of these batteries sitting around. And I mean, it's no secret why. Ryobi is basically uh, Harbor Freight if you got your head screwed on a little tighter. They're like almost the same price and maybe the quality isn't much better, but, but at least feels better in the hand and they don't use weird pigments like puce or the, that awful desaturated blue. And of course, since Ryobi knows that so many people have a drill sitting around in their house that takes this battery, they keep producing new stuff that takes this battery as well. You go into Home Depot now, they've just got this massive wall of Ryobi products that all take this battery. And some of them are just like off in the weeds, right? They've got, you know, a boom box and they've got like a, a fan and they've got an inverter so you can charge your laptop and everything else weird stuff, right? So you'll walk in there and go like, oh, hey, a flood lamp that takes that battery that I already have. And before you finish the thought, it's in your cart. Just the idea that you can take something that you feel like you're underusing and try and get more out of it, get more things that'll take advantage of that battery. It, it's a compulsion. And Ryobi has us completely nailed down. They know exactly how we tick. I'm no different, except I keep a rubber band on my wrist. And every time I walk past the Ryobi wall, I snap it. Then I start salivating. I don't know why that happens, but it gets me distracted long enough to make it past the wall without buying anything. But anyway, one time walking past the wall, I noticed that they had a soldering iron that took the OnePlus battery, but it was the lower end, the like $40, $45 one. And I took a look at it and it was still a little plain for my tastes. It does have a little more going on than the Milwaukee. It's got a stand, which is pretty much essential for soldering. I don't know how any of these other designs are supposed to work without one. And the iron is actually attached to the base with a cord, which means you're not gonna have to haul the battery up with you to wherever you're soldering. There's pluses and minuses to that, but being that I just wanna work on a surface, but one that's not my main workbench, one that's not necessarily next to a power outlet, this isn't actually a problem for me, but it still just looks a little basic, and I don't think it actually has temperature control. I was looking at the box at the store, and it says that it goes up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not how you want the specs on an iron to work. You don't want to be told that it might get to this very high temperature. You want to get told that it will definitely get to this specific temperature. Temperature control is essential for soldering irons. You don't ever want to buy one that doesn't have it. All those irons hanging on cards at the Home Depot, the Weller that just says 25 watt, 30 watt, 40 watt, and it's just got a 110 volt plug hanging off of it and nothing else, worthless. There is no legitimate use for them. They are complete trash. They're made like trash. You can tell just looking at them. They got a cheap plastic body, stamped sheet metal for everything north of the equator. The tip is just a hunk of metal that's been shoved in there and then bolted in place with a set screw. As soon as you use that thing for the first time, that tip just gets tilted right over so it's never straight. Feels like crap in your hand and it's got no temperature control. So it's just constantly wavering all over the place. It's going to overheat your joints, which is great if it's after business hours, but not when you're trying to get something done. They're not worth it. Spend just a couple bucks more. If you solder, but you've never used a temperature controlled station, drop what you're doing, buy one, any price, any brand, doesn't matter. Anything is better than one of those things that just plugs in the wall. Awful. But I digress. The cheap Ryobi certainly looks a little better than those things and probably has some form of temperature control, but 
I'm looking for something that's a little more specific. Honestly, let's be real. I just want my Weller station, but you know, with a battery on the back. Now that's a completely unreasonable thing to want. Why would anyone make that? How many people are actually going to buy that? Well, I'll buy that. Everything that I want, I set all of these criteria and I won't buy anything that won't meet them. And so when I find the one thing in a market that looks like it meets all those criteria, I always buy it and it either ends up being perfect or it ends up being absolute garbage that I would have known was garbage if I'd paid any attention to it beyond the fact that it looked like it actually met the criteria like this guy does here. This thing seems for all the world to be what I was looking for. It's an actual soldering station, not just an iron. So it's got a base with a stand and a temperature control. It's got a place to put your sponge. The iron is attached with a cable instead of directly to the battery. On the back here, it does say that temperature control allows you to set and maintain desired temperature. Uh, so that kind of implies they're using a feedback loop. And that was about as far as I got before I just went ahead and bought it. Pretty much sight unseen. Had I paid a little more attention to the box, I might have been a little less surprised by some things I discovered when I took it out. For instance, it says 45 watt hybrid soldering station. I looked at that and thought, what the heck does hybrid mean? Well, I don't care. I'm buying it anyway. And so I did. And so it's here. Now, I don't do much in the way of uh, reviewing products you can actually buy from a store right now, rather than the things that they stopped selling 25 years ago. Uh, largely because there's lots of other people doing it and also because I don't want to look like a shill. Uh, Ryobi is exactly the kind of company that would pay people to shill. Fortunately, nobody but me cares about that, so we'll just press on. There's not a whole lot in the box. You got the base, you got the iron, and you have a stand for the iron. Now this clips on to the side, like, yeah. When you, when you swing it in, it's got a little retention nub in there, and it's not very positive. You can just pop it right back out. And of course, your first thought is, well, if I have an iron in there, if I hit it, isn't it going to pop out? And, and yeah, it absolutely is. But the alternative would be a lot worse because the reason this swings off like this is so you can pack it up so you can throw it in your tool bag. And if this guy didn't come off, believe me, it would be miserable. If you've ever tried to transport one of these that's attached to like a sponge holder, so you got a little uh, a sort of a gator jaw like this, it just gets tangled up with everything in your bag. It's a disaster. Other than that, it's got this little Ziploc. It's got a little bit of starter solder just to get you started. And it's got the sponge. If you've never seen a soldering sponge before, by the way, they're sold dehydrated and flattened like this. Uh, you soak them in water and they thicken right up to a half an inch. And then you've got uh, one tip in here. It's not a replacement tip. It's different from the one that comes in the iron. Uh, this one is a great big massive screwdriver tip, one of the biggest soldering tips I've ever seen. And that actually makes a lot of sense because the one in the iron is a fairly fine precision point. And this really represents the two kinds of work you're likely to do with a tool of convenience like this. You're either going to go touch up one or two reasonable little joints on like a, a printed circuit board somewhere, or you're going to attempt some ridiculous joint in a washing machine or like an automotive wiring harness that you really shouldn't be trying to mess with at all, but you're impatient. You're trying to save yourself from a six hour or a three day wait, and you're just going to go for it anyway. So these really fit the bill and that's pretty much it. That's uh, everything that comes in the box. It's everything you'd want to come in the box. Now, as I get into looking at the outsides of it, you may start start to notice what it is that made me want to make a video about this, but I'll get to it when I get to it. Here's the rest of the externals first. Uh, so you've got your power button here that's also your temperature control knob. I sort of like the fact that this is a potentiometer rather than an infinitely rotating rotary encoder that you would have to like uh, compare to some little bar graph here or something like that to figure out what temperature you're supposed to be at. On the flip side, it's possible that it's connected to some sort of extremely dumb circuit inside. What you want from an iron is active feedback. You want there to be a thermocouple up inside here where it's taking a measurement of the absolute temperature of the iron tip. It's feeding it back to a microcontroller and it's comparing it to the exact position you chose on this knob to make sure that it's within a few degrees of that. What this could be doing instead is feeding some sort of very simple analog voltage controller where instead of checking to see if the temperature here is the temperature you selected, this is just picking a proportional voltage and then it just pumps that voltage into this thing continuously and hopes that you land somewhere around where you wanna be. But in this day and age, doing this correctly is so cheap that I imagine they probably do have a sensor up here, especially because there's a ton of wires in this cable, which we'll get to later. 
And it definitely has some kind of smarts in there because uh, it actually has more intelligence than my Weller station. Uh, let's put a battery in here. So when you turn this thing on, the LED goes solid to tell you that it's heating up. Then when it reaches temperature, it goes green. But when you turn it off, it starts blinking red to let you know that it's cooling down so that you don't turn this thing off, turn around, forget what you're doing, think it's been longer than it has or forget you had the iron on. You pick the thing up, throw it in your tool bag and it melts a hole right through the side or you go to pick it up, you burn yourself on the iron. Neither of those are great. So this is a fantastic feature and it suggests that they do in fact have a thermal sensor up here. Otherwise, how would they know when the tip is safe to touch? There's storage here for a bunch of tips, and of course, they're not kind enough to like make a deal with Weller or something to use standard ones. So it takes yet another proprietary kind of tip. You can only get them from Home Depot online. You gotta order them. It's 20 bucks for a two pack. That's the exact same ones you get with this, the huge screwdriver tip and the precision tip. You got the sponge holder here, which didn't look very well retained at first. It looks like it would just fall out if you threw this in your tool bag, but it's actually press fit in there pretty tight. You gotta really work it out of there. So not too worried about that. Then on the back, you of course have the battery mount, but there's something back here that I would have known about if I had actually read the box. It also takes 110 volts. That's what hybrid meant on the box. It'll run either off of the OnePlus battery or it'll run off of an extension cord. You can just uh, get any old extension cord and jam it in there. So it's like hooking up a weed eater. And that actually appeals to me specifically because I'm more often in situations where I could drag an extension cord over and set this thing on a cardboard box than situations where I could drag my Weller over and actually find space to set up both the station and the stand and get the thing hooked up. So that's pretty much the outside of it, right? Like you've got the iron and you got the station and uh, the controls are very simple and it takes the two types of power. Okay, that's cool and that's it, right? But as soon as you get this thing out of the box, there are two things you notice about it. First is that the chassis here is incredibly dense. It's really, really dense plastic. You see these wings back here? They look like they could be kind of a liability. Like maybe you could uh, drop this thing and break those off or something. They are impervious to any kind of flexion. They do not bend. And the whole thing just has like, it's got some weight to it and it's just, it feels solid in the hands, which is a silly thing to say about something that's not actually a tool you're supposed to use in your hands. But still, instant feeling of high quality, right? The sort of thing that, uh, if you're Ryobi, a company that made their name by selling people tools that feel better built than they actually are, then this is how you approach it, right? But look, I'm not immune to propaganda. It works on me just as much as anybody else. You want to own something that feels like this, just to, just to have something that's not disappointing, because everything else is so disappointing when you touch it. And the iron is no different. This thing, this thing feels better than any other soldering iron I've touched in my life. It's uncanny how nice this thing feels in the hand. And I'm not just talking about the, uh, the rubber over molding. Uh, I'm sort of divided on that stuff myself. It's the whole thing. It's got a weight to it. Again, if you're trying to fake somebody out and make a tool feel higher quality than it actually is, then you make it heavy, right? But this thing seems like the weight is coming from real actual material that serves a purpose. I'm not sure what this body is made out of. Can't see a maker's mark or anything like that. But if we move up to here, this is where it starts getting really interesting. I don't know my plastallergy too well, but this has got that look. I think it might be that uh, PA6 nylon that AVE is always talking about uh, that often has all the like glass fiber in it. It's got the look that I associate with that. And assuming that the little knife trick actually works, it does have the noise as well. And everything else north of the equator on here has pretty much the same thing going on. This whole region, right? It's all way overbuilt. This uh, little metal spider here, I'm not super sure what this is made of. And I'm not sure if it's machined or cast or centered or what, but it just looks too heavy duty for this application. Look how much meat is on that thing. There's just so much of it. On one of those cheap hang tag Weller irons, and a lot of irons really, this will just be a piece of flat stamped sheet metal with three holes in it. Now it is taking the lever load from whatever you're pushing on up here because remember that when you're soldering like on a, a PCB, you're pushing the iron down into the workpiece, right? And the force from that is being transferred up through the tip, through the shaft, 
onto the spider here. So it is going to be taking a, a pretty decent load. Much If you're using it heavily, you're going to be leaning on this thing pretty hard. That's fair, but I've still never seen it built that heavily. And then as we proceed up here, we've got the nut for the barrel here. On my Weller at home, this part looks like it's just been stamped, and then the knurling they put on it is really lightweight, whereas this one looks like they actually spent some time on a lathe with it. It's wild. The soldering tip here is closer to one of the Weller ones than not. I actually would not be surprised to learn that there are Weller tips that would fit on here. Uh, I'm sure if I Google it, somebody will say, oh yeah, just get the WTS uh, SP series. Uh, they'll fit just fine. But like I said, on the really cheap irons, uh, this is just a slug that goes down inside of a tube and then it's got a screw that holds it on. In this case, it uses the, uh, the barrel nut. When you pull it off, however, it does expose the bare ceramic heating element. Now, like I said earlier, I've never seen this on an iron of any price before. The really cheap wellers, you can't see the heating element. It's buried down inside the tube. I'm not super sure what this is about. It does look breakable. Like if I were to put this on here and then just give it a sharp whack, whatever that thing is, I'm sure I would snap it off. Maybe that's why this stuff is built so heavily, right? Because if this guy here were to give, then that ceramic tube is gonna take all the force that you're putting on the tip and it would break right away. So if that is the case, then this is all actually out of necessity, but nonetheless, they could have cheaped out and just let you break it and then sold you a replacement heating element or a replacement iron or something. So while I'm not totally sure what I'm looking at here, my intuition says that this thing is built about as well as it should be, which is weird for a Ryobi tool. They don't build crap, but they build it exactly as well as they have to to not look embarrassing and then move on. So hey, this shill video is going pretty good, right? I'm gonna get paid in no time. Sure looks like I brought you here to tell you this was the best thing since sliced bread and you should get to Home Depot and throw your credit card at the door as fast as you can before they run out of stock. But I actually came here to tell you that this thing is a contradiction of itself. This and this are built better than I would expect from Ryobi. And that's strange and noteworthy, but even more so, this is built worse than I would expect from Ryobi, and unacceptably so, in fact. They screwed the pooch with this cable. Those of you afflicted with the same brain worms as me have been looking at this cable the whole time, just aghast, going, what, what on earth is this thing doing here? It's so out of place. And for those of you who aren't sure what we're so upset about, notice that this cable is sort of forming a kind of a W, kind of a U shape, right? It's got these harsh bends here and here, and if I try to straighten it out, notice how it just sort of pushes itself up in the air here so it can try and maintain the same shape. If I pull like this, it doesn't straighten out. If I do this, it just pushes the whole bundle around. The cord connecting a soldering iron to its base station is a critical design element and it should be made out of a rubber. Silicone or nitrile or I don't know what else, Again, not great with my plast allergy, but it should be some kind of elastomer that's highly flexible and has high temperature resistance. This is neither of those. This is PVC. If you've got a desktop PC, I promise you, the cable going into your power supply looks exactly like this. Same sheen and everything, because it's the same material, polyvinyl chloride. It's one of the most generic plastics in existence. It's incredibly cheap. It saved Ryobi a couple cents to use this cable, and it's utterly unacceptable. There's two reasons for that. The first one is usability. Notice that as I'm pushing this thing around, as I'm trying to use this iron, the cord is getting in the way, it's fighting me. Obviously, if I unbundled it, that would be better, but no matter where I put this thing, it's gonna have this intrinsic bend in it. And every time that I throw it into my tool bag, it's gonna put a new bend in it. So every time I'm using this, when I'm moving it around, it's gonna be running into my wrist, pushing away from it or pushing towards it. It's got a mind of its own. It's making suggestions about how I should move the iron and that's wrong. A rubber jacketed cable doesn't do that. It goes exactly where you put it. You push on it and it just moves. It takes whatever shape you wanna give it. It's completely invisible to the user. It's wonderful stuff. But the second, much more concerning issue is the temperature rating. This iron starts out at 400 degrees Fahrenheit or 204 degrees Celsius, and it goes up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit or 482 degrees Celsius. Let's take a look at the temperature rating on this jacket. Oh, I'm sorry, is that? Is that 80 degrees Celsius? This iron cannot run cool enough to not melt through this jacket. Someone's probably gonna respond and say I'm misunderstanding what this temperature rating means, but it doesn't matter because honest to God, the thing will just blast right through the jacket. All right, we're at temperature, the lowest temperature it'll go. 
And if we touch this guy on here, it just goes right through it like nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I just skimmed this over the surface of the cable and it's just mangled and mutilated. If I were to just set this iron on here, just like lay it down, like if I forgot it and just set it down on top of the cable, it would melt all the way through the jacket. It would go through the outside, then it would go through all the wires inside, which are also PVC insulated, but we'll get to that later. And it would just go right on through to China. That's obviously a severe safety issue, right? Although this probably isn't dealing with significant voltage, you, you probably can't get shocked on it. You still just destroyed your whole iron, melted, vaporized a whole bunch of plastic, and now this thing's ruined because this cable is permanently attached. It doesn't unplug here. On a Weller or a Heiko, you can unplug the iron, throw it away, buy a new one because it doesn't detach here, unfortunately. But you buy a new iron for, you know, 30, 40 bucks, whatever, plug it back in, you're back in business. Here, you're going to have to replace the entire unit. Now, Ryobi doesn't want to sell you an iron assembly when that's only going to be like 15 bucks total because of the low cost of the entire thing. They want to sell you a whole new unit if anything gets damaged. It's not really worth it to them to sell you parts anyway, so they don't bother putting the connector on here. But that just makes this even worse. If this were made of silicone or nitrile, you would not be able to burn through that with the iron, so it would be moot. The only way you'd be able to damage it such that you'd have to replace the whole unit is to cut it mechanically with something. So you can see what I mean, that this thing is a peculiar contradiction in terms. It's got really well-made parts and then this bizarrely poorly made part. And of course, wherever you can see one cost-cutting measure, there's five you can't see. So. Just about as soon as I got this thing out of the box, I was ready to follow in the footsteps of many wiser men than me. Instead of turning it on, I took it apart. And of course, that was a deeply frustrating process because Ryobi doesn't want you to take it apart. You know, what else is new? But still, there's a gradient of user hostility, and this one is built much further towards the hostile end. Naturally, it's got real deep screw holes on here because it's got to get all the way through the bottom of the clamshell to the bosses in the top. Now, there's two ways to do that. One is you get real long screws, so that when you screw them in, they go in like this, and then the heads are sitting down here at the bottom, and you can get at them with any old stubby screwdriver, but if that were the case, you'd see the heads right there, and you don't. They chose the cheaper option, getting the little one-inch screws, so the head is all the way up here, and you need a screwdriver as long as you're, well, anyway, you need a long screwdriver to get in there. And, of course, it can't be anything simple. They're not Phillips heads, they're Torx T25, I think, and as is often the case with newer stuff, these holes here aren't straight channels. As these holes go deeper, they taper so that at the bottom, they're much narrower than they are at the top. I'm not sure if this is because of like mold draft angle or if they're just being assholes, but the result is that you need a pretty slim screwdriver to get down to the things. And who has a non hex bit Torx driver sitting around? All I had, of course, was just those little multi-bit kits. My T25 didn't even begin to reach down in there before it bottomed out on the sides of the hole. So I had to go to the hardware store and buy a new one that was long enough to get down in there. And of course, all they had was this very long impact bit, and the hex continued up till right under the Torx head. So I would stick it down in there, and it would make it part of the way and then bottom out anyway. So I had to take this thing to the bench grinder to make it fit and uh, <laughs> my bench grinder skills haven't been tested in some years. Uh, press F to mourn. This sort of thing always pisses me off. They could have done better. I, I'm not convinced that they did it on purpose, but I'm also not convinced that they didn't do it out of at least a little bit of spite. Now, if you ever take one of these apart, you might think at this point that you haven't gotten all the screws out because it doesn't want to come apart, but it's actually just stuck together real good because of the quality of the clamshell interface. It goes together real nice, so you have to sort of crack it to get it to pop apart. Now, I got to pause. One of the big reasons I wanted to get in here was to check out the 110 volt input circuitry because that's where you're going to find a huge gradient of quality. They could make it well, they could make it crappy, they could make it unreasonably crappy, and that's something that can go out pretty easily if they did a bad job with it and make the thing, well, in this case, only half as useful since you've still got the battery to, to fall back on. I mean, in my case, the 110 volt was not what I was going for in the first place. So that's the backup to me. But I still want to know if Ryobi cheaped out on it. So if you're ready, we'll take a look at the 110 volt input circuitry. Well, I wonder which part's the power supply. 
Your eyes are not deceiving you. That is straight up an external power brick, like what would run your laptop, that they've just entombed inside this chassis. They've made a little accommodation for this specific plastic box. It's got little little bosses on the side to lock it right in place. Got a little uh, cable routing channel here for this guy to come out here. This whole thing is built around this specific power supply that they got from, let's see, Dongwon Yinli Electronics Co. Limited. And it's not even a mean well. Now, before we get too upset here, we should review the, the nomenclature on the back because they did not actually just buy these off the shelf as laptop power supplies or whatever. This didn't come with like a DC barrel jack on it because that is a diagram showing you which of the bare wires is which polarity. So this thing came with bare wires on it. That probably means that it was meant to be used industrially, purchased and then built into something that a consumer would buy. But they were probably imagining the company would either put their own DC connector on there or that they would have this cable running in the back side of this thing and then this guy would be hanging out the back of it permanently attached. I doubt that they pictured when they developed this product that it would end up inside a plastic clamshell for the rest of its life. Now, of course, this is part of a long tradition of using finished power supplies inside of things instead of building your own or, or using a, a bare component because this guy has been tested, certified, finished. This is something that could exist outside of this unit, sold as a standalone product, which means if they put it inside this unit, they're definitely good to go, right? Back in the 80s and 90s, even companies like Sega and Nintendo would buy pre-built RF modulators from some other company there's not that many components in them, but they have to get certified as a complete unit. So if they buy the finished RF modulator and put it in their game console and then just plug their composite video into it and have the antenna cable come right out the back, then they don't need to go through the process of designing the thing, but they also don't have to go through the process of getting it certified. So it saves a lot of time, money, and complexity in the development process for the product, but it's still usually not quite this egregious. What I would have expected in this kind of application is an open frame power supply, one that it looks pretty much just like this PCB here. It's basically about this size usually, and they've got a bunch of capacitors and transformers and stuff on there, but it's a finished product purchased from another company as a complete certified unit. So it just has uh, two or three pins on this side for AC input, and then it's got two pins coming out this side for DC output. As a manufacturer, you don't know anything about how this works. You don't care, you buy it, you treat it as a complete black box. But Ryobi has taken a much more literal approach to black box and actually bought a black box to put inside. And that goes so far <laughs> that they actually kept the plug. Look at that. Isn't that something? That's the original 110 volt plug that came molded onto the cable that was staked into the box here from the manufacturer. All they did was wobble it up underneath and then build this little strap to hold it inside the chassis, and they only expose the face of it, so just the pins are sticking out. It, uh, <laughs> it, it's not even laziness. It's like working really hard to keep yourself from having to work hard. And it is kind of interesting because it says uh, it's intended to be correctly oriented in a vertical or floor mount position. If the manual for the product that's being included in doesn't include that verbiage, then I wonder if this is actually violating some kind of certification document. Uh, that's probably not binding in any way, but y you know what I mean. It's it's a weird thing to do. You know, I'll bet if we pop this out, there's probably, yep, look at that. There's a power light on there. The whole time that you're using this thing, you don't realize that there's actually a power light right under here <laughs> shining away that no one will ever see. That is creepy. It's like a skeleton sealed up in your walls. By the way, when you get the clamshell apart for the first time, you'll feel the distinctive sensation of a wire joining the top and bottom together. Uh, this conveniently just pops out right there. There's a couple little uh, tabs that retain this bale, but this bale is interesting. I didn't actually notice it until I took this thing apart. Again, because I hadn't actually read the verbiage on the box. The bale protrudes over here, and it looks like some sort of, I don't know, belt loop. <laughs> something like that. It's not labeled. It's not clear what it's for, but it is actually wired up to something. And I traced this and it turns out that it goes into the cable that goes down to the iron. And I realized that's the ESD strap. This bale is here on the outside so you can clip to it and then clip that into your anti-static ground system. And then it passes all the way through to the iron so that the iron does not potentially static shock the devices you're working on. That's pretty clever. 
ESD safety is not unusual in soldering stations, but it's usually accomplished by just using the ground pin on the wall plug, but of course this one doesn't have one, so it makes sense that they would provide this. Getting into the guts of it is getting out of my wheelhouse a little bit. Um, not an EE, but I can comment on the build quality, which here is where we start to see a little more cost cutting, or at least not doing it like you maybe should do it. Of course, wouldn't you know it, these screws here are not the same size as the screws holding the clamshell together, so I had to go get myself some drivers. Now, as soon as you get these screws out, this guy is ostensibly loose, but it won't go anywhere. I'm tugging on it pretty good because all the wires going to it are cut super short. Actually, no, I think this guy here is the offending party. Okay, with the battery clip wires freed up, this is a little easier, but it's still just really stuck in place. So if you ever need to work on this thing, if you wanna actually try and repair something, you're gonna be desoldering a lot of wires. They use a couple connectors here and here, but a lot of this stuff is just flying leads soldered right down to the board. So just the act of pulling this out to inspect it, you could snap a solder joint and make the situation worse. This thing looks pretty straightforward. There's a mess of basic transistors on there. They got a microcontroller up here, presumably, that's doing most of the actual work. Uh, there's a potentiometer here for presumably calibrating it that's been siliconed in place so you can't change it. And then otherwise, the only thing that stands out are these two big fat diodes here. I wasn't quite sure why those diodes were there at first, but after I stared at it for a bit, I realized something. The two power inputs are mechanically interlocked. If you put a battery in here, it prevents you from plugging in an AC cable. And if you plug in an AC cable, you won't be able to seat the battery. And so I was thinking it seemed odd to have the diodes because they're not rectifying anything. This guy's doing all that. So all this gets is DC. And they didn't really need to prevent these two from communicating because they can't both be plugged in at the same time. So you don't have to worry about like back feed. But then I realized that it's the input of this that's isolated when you have a battery plugged in, the output is still hooked up. So the battery plugged in would be feeding back into the output circuitry here. This would act as a potentially a parasitic load or it could even get messed up by the power back feeding into it. So they probably wanted to prevent that. And then someone on my Discord pointed out that when this guy is plugged in, they don't want the power going back out to the battery terminals where you could drop a quarter in there or something, short amount and start a fire because there's three amps coming out of this thing. And that's a good point too. The quality of the workmanship on these boards is not hot. They didn't bother cleaning off any of their flux. So these boards are just filthy and there's a bunch of handwork on them. So I can imagine that sometimes these things don't get done quite right. They might leave a solder bridge in place. So if you were in here trying to fix one of these that was DOA or died right after you got it, that might be something you'd wanna look for. Of course, truth be told, I don't recommend you get in here anyway because all these wires really wanna go exactly where they wanna go. Everything has a special place that it's got to be slotted into. Notice in these baffles in here, that each one has these little slots cut in for the wires to route through. If you get these guys out of the slot like that, and then you set this power supply in here and try to close up the clamshell, when you run the screws down, you will cut every one of those wires right in half and ruin the thing. Because there isn't a millimeter of extra wire in here, you're gonna have to splice extensions onto every one of those little wires in order to get everything hooked back up. It's not worth it, you just have to buy a new machine. But while we're in here, I'll point out that this stuff is also insulated with PVC and it shouldn't be. This really wants to be Teflon, especially if it's going through a PVC outer jacket because that's also resistant to heat and it would make up some for the PVC outer jacket, but it's also just a better insulation for wire that's, that's doing what it's doing. With that said, there are a couple remaining things in here that are better built than they really have to be. Uh, for instance, this guy here where the uh, soldering iron cable comes into the chassis, I thought at first that it wasn't strain relieved. When I looked at it on the outside, I was really worried because it just goes straight inside. There's no boot out here, but it actually has this labyrinthine strain relief in here that seems seems like it would work pretty well. You're not gonna break any, any solder joints inside by tugging on that thing. That said, if you look closely here, you can see there's these little sort of T-shaped impressions in the cable jacket. And that's because on the mating half, this is what holds that cable indexed into the slot. It's these really thin partitions, really sharp corners on them. 
these are kind of eaten into the cable. And I, I think there's a few scenarios where if, if you even had like enough vibration on this cable, you might actually be able to get those to slowly eat their way through the jacket. So I wish they'd made these thicker, like uh, these uh, baffles up here. Not really sure why they couldn't have done that. But having said all that, I am now compelled again to comment on just how rigid this chassis is. It is absolutely nuclear. It's made out of polycarbonate uh, mixed with ABS, which uh, I seem to recall is a pretty nice combination. It certainly feels that way. I think it's why it's got that sort of feeling of uh, uh, solidity to it. It's because the, the polycarbonate adds that sort of uh, rigidity that you just don't feel in plain ABS. And then baffles, 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 all these internal partitions just give this thing so much rigidity. These bosses are incredibly thick. Everything in here, every part of the clamshell is just built like a fallout shelter. It is absurd how much plastic they put into this. And I'm not really sure why. Are they, are they compensating for something? Because <laughs> this, this seems unnecessary. I'm not sure why they did this. And in fact, after I marveled at the density for long enough, it got me to thinking about the heat situation. I don't work in industry or anything, but I've seen a lot of plastic in my time, and this is a really nice casting. It's got a lot of fine details, including this lip along here, the interfaces with the one up here. It fits together so well that you think at first that there might be a, like an O-ring in there. And even without that O-ring, I'm thinking to myself that you can't get much heat out of this thing. This plastic is so heavy and the gaps are so small that any heat generated in here is gonna just get cooped up in there for quite some time. It's gonna take a long time for it to diffuse through these thick plastic panels and there are no gaps for it to escape from. The only exception is right up here in the bottom, you got these tiny cooling slots at the very bottom of the thing, but you really want cooling slots to be at the top for obvious reasons. Any heat coming off these diodes, for instance, I don't know if it's gonna make its way over there. It seems like you could get a lot of hot air built up inside this thing that wouldn't go anywhere. And that kind of feels like the final contradiction here. This, this thing is just 50-50. Beautifully built chassis, beautifully built iron, seems like a good feature set, but then weird power supply choice, really kind of chintzy construction quality, absolutely skimped on the wiring, didn't use any connectors, they didn't absolutely have to, kind of iffy choices for cable routing and not so ideal cooling. So the whole thing is just all over the place. In the end, would I recommend you buy it? I have absolutely no idea, I've never used it. Other than using this thing to melt its own cable, I haven't actually used it to heat up a joint yet. That's for after business hours. I just wanted to talk about how it was built because it really, really threw me for a loop. I, I couldn't believe that that power supply was in there like that. That's nuts. I've seen this maybe once before and it was in a much cheaper, crappier piece of equipment. I'm not saying this is bad, it's just a bad look. Although it did make me curious because I bought one other Ryobi device when I was there. This here is one of their work lights. Uh, it's got the adjustable uh, LED head on it so you can uh, point it in different directions, uh, face it up and down, etc. This is kind of cute. It's got this little bail up here, kind of looks like a padlock and it sort of is. If you swing it like that, you can pop it up, hang it on something. So you can uh, clamp it over a pipe or something like that. Neat feature, really poorly built. Really should have made that like twice as thick as it is. Doesn't, doesn't lock very positively either. And this thing is not super turbo bright, uh, it's okay. I don't feel too disappointed. But what got me intrigued here is that it also has the hybrid power input, which I also didn't know until I bought it. So this one being much smaller probably does not have a power supply this size in it, but I wonder if they used an open frame or built their own, or if it just has uh, like one of those uh, wall warts in it, right? It doesn't seem like it could, but maybe. So now that I've got the right size Torx driver, Let's go ahead and tear this apart. Good crack on those screws when you break them loose. Wow. Wow, that is deafening. It sounds like I broke the boss off. It's like when you're working on some old piece of 80s uh, video game kit and you, you, you give it a tweak and you, you just know in your head that screw's just gonna spin there all day long. You know, this thing was under tension. When I popped those screws out, look at that. It just spread right apart. What are we gonna find in here? Eh, eh, eh. Doesn't wanna come. Oh, <laughs> it's stuck together with the Ryobi logo. Reveal, attempt number two. 
wants the other side to come off first. Reveal. Attempt number three. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. That <laughs> is just outstanding. No shame. Absolutely shame. And why should they have any shame? There's nothing wrong with it. Perfectly natural. Uh, we all do it. That's fun. I didn't actually expect that. Uh, I recognize that name. I have no idea who it is, but I actually recognize that name. I suspect if I looked up this model number, I'd actually find one. This might not be that bad a product. It's Hey, it's UL listed. FCC. Wow. This, this is actually maybe one of the better little wall warts I've ever seen. And the irony of it is it's only putting out 20 volts at 0.85 amps. That's like what? Uh, 16 watts? Something like that? And it's not nothing. I love that they managed to get one with a perfectly flat boss here. Uh, much of the time they got like uh, little ridges on them or they're not this big, right? You'll just have a much smaller boss uh, around the plug. This one, they got one that's big enough. It fits right into the bottom of the thing in the exact same footprint as uh, their battery system. So that was either very lucky or they commissioned these things, which might be the case given that this is a 20 volt power supply, which is intriguing because this one is an 18 volt power supply. So it's interesting to me that with them both taking the same battery standard, they chose an 18 volt for one and a 20 volt for the other. Was that because these were already available and for some reason they couldn't get an 18 volt in this package? Or is it because uh, as far as nominal goes, this light does better with the higher end of the 18 to whatever 23, 24 volt uh, range that these batteries actually put out? Many questions, ones I'm not qualified to answer. And uh, honestly, that's about it. I'm tapped out. That's all the information I can offer uh, if, if you want to call it information. Like I said, this isn't a review and I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I thought the construction of this thing was really buck wild. Not like anything I've taken apart before. If you're new to my channel, uh, please subscribe. It helps me out. Remember to turn on notifications. That helps us both out, I'd like to think. If you like this particular kind of thing, let me know. It's been a long time since I did sort of a top-down, let's take something apart on the bench sort of video. Uh, I used to do a lot more of these. Uh, I kind of fell off that horse, but if you dig it, uh, maybe I'll do more of these. If you really liked what you saw, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks are here. Uh, it's quite an understatement at this point to say that I couldn't do this without them because I'd be upside down in my lease if they stopped supporting me. So thank you all so much for not putting me in severe uh, financial jeopardy. Great of you. Everyone else, however, just gets a plain old thanks for watching. No frills.